Welcome to our Saturday simulcast, March the 4th edition. And today's show, we will have three separate guests. We'll have Tom Deanhart and Mike Carmen join us for the first segment. And also we'll have Bobby Riddell, of course, the Purdue Radio, sports radio analyst from the Purdue men's basketball broadcast. And then Tim House, the executive uh, associate athletic director, associate vice president for development, talking about NIL and, of course, fundraising at Purdue and in Purdue Athletics. We also want to thank, of course, the Union Club Hotel and the Boiler Up Bar, 811 Bistro, for the sponsorship of this. And to remind folks that Mike Carmen and myself will be at the Boiler Up Bar in the Whiskey Room on Wednesday, March the 8th, 7 p.m. You can join us on Facebook Live, but better yet, join us in the Boiler Up Bar for that event. So without further ado, we'll bring you Mike Carmen and Tom Deanhart for our first segment. Good thing. But Mike and Tom, uh, you know, I, we'll start with men's basketball, certainly a uh another walk in the park we're kind of laughing about that with the purdue men winning last night in madison the purdue women had a crazy win as well over the over the badgers a few miles about four hours north of where you were mike last night but put that a little bit in perspective just because purdue did have the outright championship i don't know if the team did sound like the team didn't know it uh prior to the start of that game against the badgers but uh still a big win to get to get the job done and and come out of madison with a win and maybe a change and uh, brought up the confidence level of this team no you're right the players didn't know but matt painter did ask uh i think at halftime if well who had won the game and he was yeah. told and he didn't tell the players so yeah. and not i don't know if that would have mattered or not uh, in the in the big picture but it's for them. They needed to win the game just so they could say we, you know, we got the outright championship. They're able to celebrate it mm -hmm. on their own on their own terms uh, yeah. with a victory. So that was good. Not you know, and I think a a win like that, where again you didn't shoot the ball well again from perimeter um, on the road, and you know Wisconsin's not a great basketball team this year, but it's always a tough environment, and you know that that's the kind of win that can push you into the postseason and at least give you a little bit of a foundation as you go to the Big Ten tournament now, feeling a little bit better about yourself. Um, whenever, you know, whoever they play in that first game next Friday. And, you know, still got Illinois on Sunday, which I think they want to finish off the home por portion of this schedule on a positive note. And being able, you know, I, I don't know if they're going to pass out their, their hats and their T-shirts, Big Ten champs and stuff like that, but you don't want to do something like that after a loss. So mm -hmm. this team, this team still motivated to, to go get it. And, um, you know, some, some good individual performances. Good to see Fletcher Lawyer kind of get back his mid range game going again. Yeah. Uh, you know, changing the starting lineup with, uh, Mason and Brandon Newman going in. Newman played very well defensively, uh, in the first half and had a steady pace about him. Um, and that was, that was a positive. Uh, I think to see and and they got contributions from up and down the board. Maybe not uh, a lot of double digit scorers, but they had mm -hmm. enough contributions uh, from a David Jenkins, from you know Ethan Morton. Yeah, even though he, yeah, he missed a, he missed a free throw late, but he hit two threes. It's up you know earlier in the game. So you know this is kind of a team that we've we've seen when they're at their best. They they get a lot of contributions from different people and. That was the case last night, and you know, hit nine to ten free throws in the last three minutes is on the road is is a is a big deal. Yeah, yeah, Mike. Just since I'm a guy who likes to look around the corner, like most people, <laughs> um, what does Purdue need to do? You think? And I know there's a lot of things out of their control, but I want you to sort of hypothesize. What do you think Purdue needs to do to to to, to maintain that number one seat in the NCAA tournament? Well, I think you win. I mean, you win Sunday against Illinois, and then uh, I think you win a couple games, at least a couple games in the Big Ten tournament. And a, a lot of it's going to be dictated to what happens around you, too. Uh, does Alabama lose? Does Houston lose? Does, you know, Kansas got a very difficult Big 12 tournament to navigate? And, you know, and what does UCLA do? I think Purdue's resume – who they've beaten, when they've beaten them, where they've beaten teams, still stands out. Um, so, you know, at least if you get to the semifinals, I think they're, they'll be in pretty good shape. 
uh, and definitely you get to the finals, they'll be, I think there'll be a lock for a number one seed. It's just a matter where they fall on the line, whether they're, I, I, I they'd have, I think they'd have to win the big 10 tournament to get, to have a chance at the number one overall seed. And I think that would probably take Alabama and Kansas potentially losing in their conference tournaments for that to happen. But that process happened so late on Sunday that the bracket's going to be pretty well set before the Big Ten championship game tips off. Uh, but they'll have they'll have some variations of whatever brackets they want to go with, depending on who who wins and loses those games on Sunday. But you know they just they've got to win some games here and uh, see what happens. Don't you think, Mike, just a win against Illinois and one win in the Big Ten tournament, no matter what anybody else does, shouldn't that be enough to get keep Purdue on the one line? Should be enough, but again, you know, tell me what Kansas is going to do. Tell me what UCLA is going to do. Tell me what Alabama is going to do. Because uh, a lot of this is a byproduct. You, you can do what you need to do, but some of it also what happens the last weekend with some of those other teams. Uh, and that could be the difference between yeah, – to me, there's five teams in the race for a number one seed. You know, one of those teams is going to get left out. But, you know, what's what's going to be the criteria for that to happen? And you don't want to – you don't want to give the committee a reason not to put you in that spot. And that's why I think, you know, getting to the semifinals at least is – makes you feel good that you'll be a number one seed. Yeah. The opportunity, even as a two seed – I know that Purdue fans don't want that to happen, but if that even happens, could present a interesting path to Louisville. And, and, and again, the last – you explained this well offline, but the last thing Purdue fans or anybody wants to do, anybody in the country wants to do, is count wins in the NCAA tournament. I understand that. But if you get to the Sweet 16 – you could, and you're a two seed, that might put you in a possibility of being in Louisville. Explain that a little bit if Alabama ends up being the one seed and how all that works. I know it, we're getting deep in the weeds, but that's kind of what we do here. <laughs> so that's terrible. Well, I mean, it, it's all based on geography and where you fall on the seed line. Like right. Alabama right now would be the number one overall seed. So actually they get to pick mm-hmm. what regional and first and second rounds they want to go to. Most teams, all teams, will pick the closest region not only from a travel perspective, but to help their fans get there. The only coach that I would think would, that would never pick somebody somewhere close would have been John Thompson from Georgetown. He'd love to yeah, have his team. <laughs> he loved to have his teams out west, yeah. and so he, he would have picked Seattle in a heartbeat. Yeah. But that you know, it, and they just go right down the list. So Alabama picks Louisville, then you Houston picks some or doesn't pick. They get assigned Kansas. They get assigned. Um, Whoever the like, – I'm drawing a blank on the floor. Well, UCLA, UCLA, if UCLA, UCLA. Yeah. But, yeah, let's say Purdue ends up being the first number two on the line, which would be the fifth overall seed. They're going to be placed in the closest region to them, and that would be Louisville. So, therefore, if they're a number one seed and not the, the first over, overall number one seed, they're, they're, they're going to get assigned the closest region. And if Louisville's taken by Alabama, then they're going to most likely New York or Las Vegas outside chat, chat, shot at Kansas City, but that's kind of a little bit how that process works. And they just they just go right down the line, actually. I know back in the day, they used to have just a, a computer program pop up on their screen that tells you how many miles it is from West Lafayette to wherever these locations are. And uh, so that's that's how they do it. So if you, if you want Purdue and Louisville right now, the best court course or best chance for them would probably be the number one two seed uh, of the group. Yeah, interesting stuff. Mike, uh, any uh, one or two red flags remain for you with this team? Oh, yeah. I mean, they're not shooting the ball well from the perimeter. Um, I mean, it's – I think the last five games are 23 and 93 maybe from <laughs> three-point range. Uh, they're just – I mean, and they are getting open looks because of the double teams that are coming to Zach mm-hmm. Eves. These are not forced threes. These are not – threes that um, guys are closing out on them because, you know, Purdue does move the ball pretty well. So when Zach does get it out to an open player, either that guy's shooting or he's finding somebody else that's open. My only issue with my issue with the threes is sometimes they take them too quick in the shot clock. Is that the best shot you can get? Is that the best person to take the shot? Can you move the ball a little bit more to, to move the defense? Because Wisconsin was – cheating as i say on the backside with their defender 
They were anticipating the pass coming to, to Zach Eady, and they were trying to intercept it. They were trying to get there the same time the ball got there, and they, it worked a couple times for them. But Purdue also ran a play in the second half where the ball got inside the Eady, and he found first for the dunk uh, on the back side. And I thought Purdue had a chance to do that a little bit more to kind of tell Wisconsin to back off. But three-point shooting is a concern. Uh, as said, Fletcher Lawyer got going a little bit last night, but that was more of a mid-range game for him. And and I know two, shooting two-pointers is not the uh, thing to do in basketball <laughs> nowadays, but Purdue is 20 at 29 from two-point range. And I know it's kind of a slow bleed to get to get a lot of points shooting, making twos, but – I think they can take you to the finish line, if, especially if you're struggling from three. And the, I'd like to see Purdue, when they know they're struggling from three, okay, get some two-pointers, get it to Zach, get it to somebody else, run some plays that kind of get you in the middle of the lane or around the free throw line. And you've got some good shooters there with David Jenkins and Fletcher Lawyer. Braden Smith's an excellent shoot, shooter from, from those distances. Just try to try to live and survive on that a little bit until – maybe you can get a couple threes to go down. But they're rebounding well. You know, the turnovers, I think they had 12 last night. Mm -hmm. And their defense was better, even though offense is – or Wisconsin not a juggernaut offensively. So there's still a lot of things that they're doing well. But as everyone knows, when you don't shoot well, you're perceived to be playing not very well. Yeah. But that's, that's not always the case. And uh, I think Purdue has a lot of things going in its favor. But they're going to have to hit some three-point shots next week in Chicago and – in the NCAA tournament to really go far. Yeah. Do you think, you know, with Edie only getting nine shots, now I understand had he converted on the first two possessions, which I didn't see because uh, of television issues, um, that uh, he'd had 11 shots at that point and had three-point plays. But is there a number there? I mean, do you, do you have to get him 12, 13 shots in some ways? Does he need to have – is he going to need to have a 35-17 game uh, at some point in that tournament, whether it be the Big Ten tournament or the NCAA tournament for Purdue to, to get where it wants to get to? Well, he'll need a 35-17 and 17 game if nobody else is doing anything yeah. offensively. And the beauty of this team is they do, when they're, when they're right, they get contributions up and down the lineup. And that's, that, that's what happened last night. Now, they, there was not a bunch of double-digit scores, but there was enough off the bench. Ethan Morton had seven. David Jenkins had had two two jumpers that he hit. Uh, Trey Kaufman ran. And, you know, we're seeing more and more of him with Zach Eady uh, down low, and I think that's working well for Purdue right now. So as long as you're getting contributions from other other places, you don't need 35 and 17 from Zach. Yeah. Um, I think I did come up with the stat last week that Purdue is undefeated when Eady shoots less than 10 field goals. Yeah. Uh, so it's you know it's but you know he's he's he can be effective as a passer too, as a distributor, and that's you know he's going to have to do that a lot as well. But you'd like to have Zach probably get a few more touches, and you know Wisconsin wasn't going to let him score. I mean they were going to foul him and make him go to the free throw line, and he started one for six, so the strategy was working. But he you know he made the ones at the end that counted. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know I think it is a situation too where. Uh, you've got to, you know, you got to hit on all cylinders at the right time. And that part is, is clear. All right. Well, and I want to ask Tom a question about the combine. I want to go back to you, Mike, just because you, nobody knows Purdue women's basketball better. I know you didn't really have a chance to watch. Well, maybe you did have a chance to watch a little bit of their game. It was, it was on the big screen in the Kohl Center the last yeah, uh, minute I was of the say, game. Purdue, Purdue, <laughs> Purdue double dipped Wisconsin last night, but are they safely in, in your opinion? Yeah, I think they are. I think they're in. Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't matter. I don't think it matters what happens in the Iowa game, to be honest. Uh, they they might get beat by 30. They may, you know, they may take him to the wire. Um, you know, they'll play hard and they'll they'll, they'll have a good showing. But uh, I, I I think they're in. I think they've done enough. They have uh, they have enough quality wins. Um, you know, they, they lost two games this year out of their control. The Michigan State game obviously was canceled for for those reasons, and then. The Vegas, the Vegas tournament. They only got one game right. out of that, so th they would have been going into last night or going into Thursday. They would have had twenty wins. They would have been twenty and nine. And I know twenty wins is not the standard bearer anymore, but it looks good when you have twenty wins. 
and you know they've and they've made progress in year two. They're they're in a better uh, standing in the Big Ten. They're seventh instead of ninth. Um, you know they they win a game in the Big Ten tournament. Uh, so they're they're going to be in. They're not going to have a great seed in the NCAA. But this year was all about getting in the NCAA tournament for Katie and this group. And now, and now this is when you really, this is when you really push the thing forward because you go out in the portal and get some players and then you've got a good recruiting class coming in. And this, you know, next, the next year is when you, mm-hmm. you know, you got to take another step, you know, you got to challenge for a top four spot in the big 10. And you know, a lot of it is again, dictated on what happens around you, who's coming back in the other big 10 schools and all that. Uh, she still has work to do from a talent standpoint uh but the progress is there and i think on selection sunday they'll be they'll be going somewhere to play somebody and that was the whole goal when the year started yeah tom a busy recruiting weekend this weekend for ryan walters and company in west lafayette but also uh you've got pro day next week uh give us a little little bit of insight on what you see from that to not only recruiting, but uh, the guys that are going to be trying to show off uh, what they can do uh, in West Lafayette uh, for next week. Yeah, Jalen Graham worked out uh, in Indianapolis on Thursday, and his numbers didn't glow. Not not a big surprise. I've always asked people what type of a pro he could be, and there was always some question and just about his overall athletic ability. He didn't do well in the broad jump. Uh, his 40 time was okay. Just didn't come off as a real explosive athlete. Um, very, he's got the instincts. Mike knows that. I mean, the guy, uh, the guy uh, has a nose for the ball and, and always seems to make plays. Never came off the field hardly at all last year. Has good football intelligence too, but I'll be surprised if he gets drafted. If he does, it'll be late. And, we still have Boilermakers like Aiden O'Connell, Payne Durham, and Corey Trice and Charlie Jones to work out in Indianapolis. I know Aiden O'Connell was speaking at the podium on Friday. I think Saturday is the day he works out. A lot of intrigue with Aiden, of course. Will he get picked? I bet he looks good in these drills. You know, he's not going to run well. We all know that. But I bet he spins it as well as anybody in Indianapolis. Payne Durham's the guy I think a lot of people are very interested in, too. You know, uh, Somebody described him as a clunky athlete, and I thought that was sort of an apt description. Um, uh, not the most fleet of foot, but as Mike knows, too, he's awfully productive, right? He, he always seemed to be open and, and, and make touchdown catches. He did very well in the senior bowl, too. So he may be the first boiler off the board. Um, Corey Trice probably isn't going to run very well, most people think. And uh, Charlie Jones is another X-Factor guy, right? Um, he may be a late-round pick. Uh, it's going to be fun to see how, how, how he runs and tests overall and if he's healthy, right? Yeah. Because uh, I got the sense he never was 100% last year at all. He hardly even practiced between Saturdays. So that was one reason why I think he skipped his senior bowl. I was told it was because of a toe injury. I'm sure his agent probably told him just to skip it. So we'll see uh, how he looks in Indianapolis. Then, of course, Allen, like you said, March 9th, next Thursday, those Boilermakers supposed to be in West Lafayette for Pro Day. So – They'll get a chance to sort of redo some things that they may want to redo. They're probably not going to do every drill, but some guys are probably pick and choose things they want to do that maybe they didn't excel at in Indianapolis. Yeah, Tom, I mean, Tom, do yeah. you think, you know, with the combine and the pro day being so close together, could you see some Purdue players just skipping the pro day altogether? Some could, Mike. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm led to think or believe most of them should be there, but you, who knows, right? You may make a good point. Um, from just what three or four days later to turn around and do it all over again <laughs> seems kind of silly. Uh, I was trying to think when 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 Brom usually had his pro day because typically they were already started spring football by now, so pro day occurred during spring football. It was usually it was usually it was usually closer to spring break. Okay, yeah. so yeah. Probably, which, is, which is this is next week too, right? Because right, spring but, breaks the eleventh, right? So right, so it's, well, yeah, it's usually so, closer yeah. to spring break. Yeah, that's a good point, Dom. Um, uh again we'll see who does show up uh among the five guys that are in Indianapolis we'll see some of the other non-combine guys there like Reese Taylor I'm sure will be there I know Bryce Hampton will be there as well so yeah it'll be interesting to see it's always kind of a fun event and uh see how guys test out and and as, as they start to churn toward the NFL draft which is going to be in Kansas City this year 
Yeah, going to be interesting. Kansas City this year, Detroit next year for the draft. How about that? So that uh, that uh, uh, will, will be part of the show. Thanks to Tom and Mike. And now we'll move on to our interview with Bobby Riddell. Bobby, of course, played for Matt Painter from 2006 to 2009 and now works with Rob Blackman on the Purdue radio broadcast. And he was courtside for the Boilermakers win against Wisconsin on Thursday night. Uh, just a picnic last night, wasn't it? Uh, a, a hard fought win. You know this as much as anybody. Uh, there are no style points. It was really, an, in my view, it may, may turn out, depending on how the season goes, that one of the most important wins of the season, even after uh, you're already the outright champions going into the game. I don't know if the team knew that. I think you knew that uh, during your broadcast position. But hard to minimize how important this win was just from a psyche of a, of a college basketball team that's been struggling of late. Absolutely. I mean, it was – you know, we had found out Illinois had had won the game, so you know you won the you know the Big Ten title outright, which is just wild to think that you know we lose to Indiana, and then before we before we finalize another game of our own, we end up winning the Big Ten title outright just through the course of team after team that was right behind us losing throughout the course of the week. Uh, so that was just fascinating, honestly. Yeah. But um, to your point, just for morale with the team. Yeah. Uh, the win was just so critical, you know, that Indiana loss for obvious reasons was, you know, tough pill to swallow. So, uh, you know, to be able to bounce back, get a really big win, um, on the road, you know, it made that flight home, obviously a lot happier yeah. this, you know, everyone was feeling good about themselves, even though, you know, we didn't play our best basketball, uh, we found a way to win, you know, winning at Wisconsin is never easy, no matter what team they're throwing out there. Uh, that Wisconsin team's, I think, a team that's better than their record shows. You yeah. know, they've lost a bunch of close games. You know, they took Kansas to the wire earlier this year in the battle for Atlantis. So, I mean, that, that's not a bad Wisconsin team. You know, I think we match up well with them because of Zach. His ability to defend Tyler Wall one on one um, is just so critical. You know, I, I think Tyler Wall is going to be having nightmares of, of Big Zach because you know he loves to get down there and wheel and deal and spin and, and get an angle for himself or, or draw a double team. And he's such a good passer. But with Zach, like every time he wheels and deals, like Zach's just like right there. He's seven foot four and he can recover uh, using his length. But big win for Purdue, big win for the psyche moving forward. Uh, now it would just be nice to, yeah, get a big win on senior day coming up. Yeah, that will be another non walk in the park as Illinois comes calling. Uh, a team will hit that a little bit later, but it, it absolutely passes the eyeball test in terms of a team that's got athleticism. There's maybe a little schizophrenic from time to time, but they are uh, dangerous as well. Well, uh, you know, going back to last night, interesting start to the game that most of us uh, mere mortals that are trying to scramble because we're, we're trying to get the game on TV because of the the Minnesota and uh, Rutgers 10 minute to decision to, to determine who won that game. We missed the first two or three possessions. Zach Eady had a couple shots in the room, goes one for six to start the game and uh, from the free throw line. And uh, not just that, but I think there was, uh, the narrative was slightly different because Purdue had taken punches in losses and didn't respond well against Northwestern at the end, against Maryland after it had a lead. And certainly against Indiana at home, where it had a second half lead. This game in the second half, and even to some extent in the first half, took some a couple mini runs by Wisconsin, and they responded. The Boilermakers did. That has to be a good sign as you head into tournament play because it's going to happen. You're going to have teams that are they're going to punch you in the mouth uh, throughout the course of the rest of the season. No question. I mean, the teams are going to go on runs. Basketball is a game of runs, just in general. And I liked how our ball club, ball club the other night or last night, you fall down by four points. You know, you've been leading for the most part yeah. the entire game. You're leading at halftime again by four. You know, we've had these halftime leads against, you know, Maryland, Indiana. And, you know, Wisconsin, once again, starts off the second half strong, builds that four-point lead. We're struggling to shoot the basketball. And we were able to have some resolve there and, and battle right back uh, and obviously eventually win the game. So. um yeah, in the tournament, you know, you can't, you know, if you go down by four or six points or whatever, I mean, you can't pout or hang your head. You know, you got to get right back at it and, and try to make a run of your own. So, um, you know, that's been something we, as of late, you know, we've just really struggled putting together, you know, big runs. You know, those 
they call them kill shots or whatever. If you go on a right, 10-0 right. run, we just haven't really been able to, to string together any of those double digit runs as of late. And uh, we were so good at doing that for the majority of the season. Um, and, and, you know, that it's just, those are obviously huge momentum swings in the game and our just inability right now to string together um, made three point shots, honestly, when they double Zach and take him out of the game, our inability to hit shots at a consistent level from three and, and even struggle at the foul line from time to time has, has hurt us as far as putting together these runs. So uh, maybe we'll put together some of those kill shot runs at the right moment here uh, this month. Yeah, I like you. I heard you on radio talking about kill shots. It's a new term that w- that I that I that gets used. Uh, a very good way to describe what was going on. All right, you are known as a shooter, one of the one of the best shooters you you can find. What is it? I mean, I mean, and and I know it's it's it's. Is there some bit of randomness? You know, we talked about. Brandon Newman going 0 for 5. He clanked his first couple, but he had a couple that looked like they were going down. Uh, Fletcher Lawyers had his had had some of those challenges as well. Ethan Morton hit a couple big threes. Had his third one that looked like it was going down. Do you have any? Do you have, is it? Do they need a seance? What do you What do you think from that standpoint? I mean, shooting is such a such a a, a touchy thing, and you know more than most. Uh, uh, it's a rhythm thing. But uh, how do you view that in terms of some of these guys who really are good shooters? Matt Painter keeps saying it, but it's been a struggle. Sure, yeah, it's been a it's been an inconsistent, you know, streaky deal for this team, and it really is hard to put your finger on it. I think what's our record? Is it twenty five and five? Is that twenty five right and now? five? Not bad. <laughs> yeah. So we've played thirty games. Fifteen of those thirty games, because um, I actually looked at this number last night. So fifteen of those thirty games, we've shot thirty seven percent or better from three. Yeah. Um, and in twelve of those fifteen games, we beat the opposition by double figures. Yeah. So, you know, obviously, if you shoot the basketball well from three, you're going to have success. But, you know, we have major success when we do because we're obviously really good as a team in other areas, which is why uh, in those other 15 games, we've still won 10 uh, of those 15 games when we haven't shot 37 percent from three. You know, we're a good team in a lot of areas, but, you know, we're a streaky team. Clearly, you yeah. know, half the time we're going to shoot well, half the time we're not based on the numbers this year over the sample size of 30 games. So, um you know, unfortunately, it's hard to know which produce, you know, team's going to show up from a shooting standpoint. But, you know, I think we got a lot of guys who can or are quality shooters. But shooting, as you said, it's so touchy, right? It can be it does feel like it can be contagious. Um, you know, they always say hitting in baseball can be contagious within yeah. a game. Feels like shooting for this team has been contagious. The, the games where guys are knocking shots down, everybody starts knocking them down. But the games where a couple guys struggle early, it seems like it just you know, maybe that next guy then starts to be like, you know, thinking, okay, puts a lot of pressure on himself to make that next shot or, and, you know, shooting has got to be something that, you know, I always was shooting my best when I wasn't thinking about shooting, right? Like when you're just letting your natural ability take over, you know, if you're out there thinking at all, like if I should take this next shot versus just taking something in rhythm, that's when you're going to potentially run into some issues because then you're overthinking it and you're getting mechanical and uh, that's obviously oftentimes going to lead in a miss. So, um, you know, it's, it's I, at this point, I think we kind of are who we are from a shooting standpoint. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be streaky and we're going to have to hope that if we have a game uh, in March that we wow. don't shoot it well, we're going to have to hope that we get to the free throw line and make our free throws. We dominate the glass uh, and hope that the other team uh, <laughs> doesn't shoot the ball well from three that particular day. Like we beat Maryland at home shooting 15 percent from three. But Maryland shot poorly that day as well, and we found a way to win. So um, we'll just have to see how it shakes out. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting thing. All right, Zach Eady gets nine shots in the game. We talked about the uh, couple that would have counted as shots had he made them uh, to start the game. Obviously, he got fouled and and uh, shot at the free throw line. Anything that you're seeing differently in terms of teams? I mean, you know, I, and I haven't done the research on what, you know, Zach Eady, 12 shots and above – versus under 10, under 12, he was under 12 last night. Anything that you're seeing differently there in terms of what Purdue's trying to do or how they're being defended? Uh, obviously, people are going to double team inside, but it looked like on paper that Purdue had a real advantage inside. Are they not going inside enough? Or to your liking, how do you view that? No, I mean, I think we're, you know, we're going inside to them um, as much as we can, but, uh, yeah, the way the opposition is scheming, uh, you know, there was time like we got a lob pass to Caleb first last night, 
and it was actually yeah. a set play. It was a great play call by our staff. They had started seeing that the help side defender was coming over to double Zach earlier and earlier as the game was unfolding, like trying to get a jump and read that post entry pass. And their help side defender was trying to be right. able to like time it perfectly because the best way to double a guy like Zach is you got to get there right on the catch. So yeah. if you can get there right on the catch, you know, obviously with si- if you can double him with size, that's optimal. You know, you can hopefully take away his vision and not let him see, you know, where the open players are at um, before the double arrives. So they're trying to time it up. Well, our staff saw that their help side defender was getting, um, you know, over there earlier and earlier and trying to time it. So they designed that play where um, Caleb was going to go for the lob. And so sure enough, Caleb's man comes over to double too quick and leaves that lob wide open to Caleb. So, you know, we're trying to get Zach as many touches as possible. These teams are just really making a concerted effort to get the ball out of his hands. You know, there's some other things we can do from time to time where maybe we get, we throw him the ball in the center of the lane where it makes it harder to double, and we will do that from time to time. But um, unfortunately, with you know, that's the sometimes the uh, issue with when your best player is a big, that can be the issue sometimes uh, because it's easier, I think, defensively to scheme taking a big guy out of the game uh, just because the ability to double or triple in the post. Uh, versus, you know, a perimeter player, tougher to take them out of the game sometimes because they just have the ball in open space on the perimeter. So uh, that's the unfortunate conundrum we're in at times. If teams really want to take Zach away, we're going to have to just have other guys step up and, um, you know, score the basketball. Yeah, make those shots. Like you said, uh, it's going to have to happen. All right, you know guard play as well as anybody. Uh, There's been a lot of discussion. Obviously, Fletcher Lawyer came in, did very – did. You know, did a lot of good things, especially in the first half offensively. Braid Smith hits the free throws, hit a three, I believe, as well. But uh, talk about their play. And, you know, it's by all accounts, it's been a, uh, nothing short of astounding, really, if you look at the look at the 30 game season. It's been a struggle of late to some extent because for a number of reasons, I don't think lawyers 100 percent healthy. Uh, Braden Smith is using a lot of energy out there, but talk about evaluate their play and maybe what might be next for them uh, heading not only into the big 10 tournament, but the NCAA tournament. Sure. Yeah. I think both those guys were pretty good last night. Overall. Um, it was nice to see Fletcher, you know, have a game where he gets some shots to go down. Yeah. You know, he, he made so many of those tough little floaters and leaners and finishes around the rim for the majority of the season. Uh, you know, he's been in some, you know, a little bit of a rut here, unfortunately, as of late, where just some of those kind of shots near the rim have rimmed in and out or, you know, haven't fallen, maybe gotten some contact uh, and haven't gotten a foul call here or there. So, like, you know, he's had an unfortunate stretch there. And then I think, you know, because, you know, not finishing around the rim as well, it's led into him, you know, maybe struggling with his jump shot as well. So it was nice to see him get a three to go down, finish around the rim better last night. But yeah, those guys, you know, Braden and Fletch, they've had an amazing season. You know, Braden's been so steady at the point guard position for the whole year. You know, Coach Painter loves when he's more aggressive from an offensive yeah. standpoint, looking to shoot the basketball. He took a pull up jumper late in the game last night, maybe around two and a half minutes or so, missed it. But the whole staff was applauding him as we, you know, as the the defense they were running back on defense because they just felt like it was such a good quality shot for him to come off that ball screen, be aggressive, looking to shoot. And so they're going to continue to harp on him. You know, when he's aggressive and we have Fletcher, Braden, and Zach, kind of that three-headed monster, you know, from an offensive scoring standpoint, that's when we're at we're best as a team. I feel like, you know, ideally Zach and Fletch being that one-two option and then, you know, Braden being that kind of third option facilitating, but also looking to make the defense pay if they're not going to respect his ability to shoot. So, um, you know, those guys are going to continue to have major roles on this team and, you know, they've had their ups and downs, just like a lot of guys, but overall, unbelievable seasons for them. And hopefully they're at their best here down the stretch. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting, fascinating. I mean, it's just such a cluster of all these teams in the Big Ten. Purdue emerges with uh, no worse than a two game cushion in the Big Ten uh, race, maybe a three. That hasn't happened all that many times. Uh, that's a, a impressive. But what, a, what an amazing run you may, may be on here. You're going to be head to Chicago, likely to Columbus. Maybe Louisville, Kansas City, New York. I don't know for that. Uh, and then maybe to Houston. Who knows? But we'll, like I said, the best thing is 
you know, the most important thing is it's got to be one possession at a time if you're Purdue or if you're any team in this tournament, uh, the upcoming tournaments. Uh, it seems to me that's the, that is the formula for success. Absolutely. You know, it's it's a one game season once you get to uh, postseason play. And, you know, you got to cherish every possession. And, um, you know, I, I think Purdue's uh, got big things ahead and, and hopefully, uh, you know, that happens. And I'm excited for the ride. Yeah, no doubt. All right, Bob, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate your analysis. We love your work on the Purdue Radio Network with uh, Rob Blackman. Anybody that's got to hang with Wes Scott that much time is always a good thing, too. Wes, one of the great guys as well. <laughs> Uh, to uh, the engineer, uh, on-site engineer for for the Purdue Radio Network. Those guys do a great job as well, so enjoy that. Uh, if you're a Purdue fan, uh, make sure you check their work out. I'm sure you already have if you're a Purdue basketball fan. So we'll be back in two minutes. We'll have Tim House, uh, Purdue uh, Executive uh, Vice or Vice President and uh, Senior Associate Athletic Director, talk some John Purdue Club and NIL and how he is navigating that course. Uh, that's a challenge as well, so we'll look forward to doing that and uh, uh, we'll be back in two minutes on Golden Black Live. Thanks to Bobby Riddell for the interview and now we'll move on to Tim House, the Executive Senior Associate Athletics Director and uh, the, also the Associate Vice President for Development for Purdue Athletics and uh, Tim will be commenting on all kinds of issues as it relates to not only the Purdue sports but also uh, coaching hires, et cetera. So without further ado, here's Tim House, Executive Vice President or ex Executive Senior Associate Athletic Director, say Associate Vice President for Development at Purdue and a grizzly veteran here. He's been been here almost five years, which is hard to believe that Tim has been in, in West Lafayette for that period of time. And nothing's changed in athletics at all, Tim. Isn't that amazing how nothing has changed at all in your in, in your world, right? <laughs> nothing, nothing. I uh, did you choose Grizzly on purpose because I look like Grizzly Adams? Yeah, I think that I think that was a Freudian <laughs> deal. I don't know, but you, you, <laughs> no, time flies when you're having fun, though. I mean, we have had a blast. It's been really, it's been a really cool time to be in West Lafayette. Yeah, no doubt. And and uh, Tim is a youngster, and he's got he just Purdue just hired a football coach that's in his age range, I should say. And, uh, you know, just that whole process, you're there front and center looking at that. I mean, obviously your role in fundraising and development is important, but you're looking at the big picture. Talk about Ryan Walters and just that experience of what you like about him and his very, very young and uh, hip staff, so to speak. This is going to be an interesting uh, ride for Ryan and company come, uh, come, come right now, but also when the fall gets here and Fresno State comes to town on the 2nd of uh, September. Well, Al, about the only thing I don't like about Coach Walters and his staff thus far is it's the first time I've ever, you know, been older than our head football coach uh, <laughs> anywhere I've worked. And, and that is really uh, a realization that, like, hey, I, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. Ah. Um, I'm, I'm 37, Ryan's 36. Every single thing that you could evaluate Ryan on up to this point, I've loved. I mean, as a coworker, he, he's first off, let's just start with the basics. The blocking and tackling, if you will, pun intended, he yeah. is a really good human being. Yeah. He is a really nice person. He is considerate of others. He uh, has really taken a great amount of time and interest in getting to know everyone in our department and how they help his program and, and, and how we could help him better. You know, I mean, they sort he's sort of done listening sessions and you know his first week on the job he had me in his office and wanted to learn who our key stakeholders were were what was the history of the John Purdue Club how could he help um you know and, and made very clear you know I want it I want to be involved I want to get in front of our fan base um I think he's extremely self-aware uh, I think he's extremely coachable what you don't often think about that with a head coach but you know he he knows that he's new at Purdue and he needs to learn certain things about what we've done here up to this point. And uh, man, he absorbs everything like a sponge and is extremely appreciative and gracious in the process. And, and I'm really not just saying that. I mean, I, yeah. I, I mean it and, and really his whole staff has kind of fallen in that same line. You know, they're all just really good people. Um, they work really hard. And I think they believe, I know from being around, they believe Purdue can be truly, truly great and do it in a way that everyone's going to be proud of and, and enjoy being around. 
You know, one thing we we've talked over the years, even before you, long before you got here, that Purdue and football historically needs to have a better mousetrap. I mean, it's a competitive league, and it's never been easy for for any team. Maybe, and it's not easy necessarily for Ohio State and Michigan, but it's a challenge to to stay at that level. Uh, Joe Tiller brought an exciting offense. Jeff Brom did that same thing. This is a different different take. You got a defensive guy, but I think that relative youth. Uh, and enthusiasm and the fact that he's gone out and got Graham Harrell, et cetera, you may have a better mousetrap, just a different type of mousetrap heading into that, uh, uh, not only the 2023 season, but down the road. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I I think Purdue's always going to be pretty darn good at offense. And oh, by the way, we got a great offensive coordinator. I mean, the quarterbacks have traditionally wanted to play here. Skill position players have wanted to play here. Um, and so if you can bring someone in who you know is, is of the caliber Graham is to run that side of the ball, I don't worry about us skipping much of a beat. No, and that's no disrespect to Jeff. I obviously know Jeff was a great offensive mind. But, yeah. you know, again, I think we have to remember Purdue has always been a place that's attracted great offense long before Jeff was there and, and is going to long after he leaves. Now, to bring someone in with Ryan's background, though, I think is intriguing because we, we have never had – someone quite this elite nationally in terms of the accolades he had, the numbers he put up last year in Illinois. To me, it's looking like, hey, where are our gaps? Let's go get someone who fills those gaps. Um, but, but really, for me, what it comes down to is the people that Ryan surrounded himself with. If you look at the jobs people left to come work for this guy, it, it's, it's pretty incredible. I think it speaks volumes. I mean, you've got people leaving big-time programs, uh, for, for the same job, not not necessarily even taking steps up, but because they believe in him. And I, I think that's where I find myself most excited. Again, the people he surrounded himself with and the way that they treat people, going back to my previous answer, um, are, are really big. And the last thing I'll say, I think he's one heck of a recruiter. I mean, he is. I, I've got some stories that, I mean, I've already heard about, you know, some of the recruiting battles he's won. I mean, rec- Hudson Card's recruiting story is yeah. incredible. Someday I'll let Ryan tell that to you someday. Yeah. <laughs> It's just a great story that he just – he went and got what he who he wanted, you know. I mean, and he's uh, – Coach Painter uh, always says, you know what makes a great coach? Great players. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think that he's pretty smart for saying that. He's smart for a lot of reasons. But yeah. uh, I think Ryan subscribes to that theory and his staff subscribes to that theory and the detail uh, with which they, they've operated in, on the recruiting trail and the effort they've put into that, uh, I find myself very excited that we're going to be just fine in football. In fact, we're, we're going to keep building uh, th- this thing even higher than it's been the past couple of years. Yeah, you know, you look at that and uh, uh, it is, there's a lot of intrigue and a lot of uh, things going on. Ryan seems to be also extremely detail-oriented if you watch him in terms of, and defensive guys can be that way, but uh uh, def- detail oriented with an extremely good personality. I've been very impressed in my limited time around him as well. All right. You talked about Matt Painter, uh, another walk in the park for the Boilermakers last night uh, with a win over Wisconsin. You've been around teams uh, for your professional and, and personal life. Things happen in the college basketball season, and this has been a wacky one. Purdue has won the Big Ten. They're going to do it in an undisputed fashion for the 13th time. Um, you know, the, just a huge win last night. Hard, kind of hard to quantify from a team perspective how important that win is just to kind of right the ship and, and get things moving in the direction that uh, you want at the right time of the year. One would think last night has a lot to do with that. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it was – I, it wasn't a must win, obviously. We're in a great spot. But as you alluded to, Alan, I think it was a big win. I mean, I think, it, you know, Matt spiced some things up a little bit, changed the starting lineup a little bit. You know, I, I love all of our kids, but it's always nice to see a kid uh, get a chance like Brandon Newman got last night and see Brandon really step up in a big way defensively and gain some confidence that I think is going to carry into March. I mean, like his athleticism um, it really is, is a game changer for us when he's able to be out on the court and stop the other guy, the other team's, you know, key perimeter scorers. And then, you know, a couple of times last night, turned it into buckets and then made some big free throws down the stretch. Mm. Um, back to make those free th- I think making nine out of those last 10 free throws is huge preparation for March. Yeah. Huge preparation for March. And I think we sometimes get lost in the, in the sauce, you know, like it, it was a tough stretch you know, of, of four or five games there. In the grand scheme of things, 
it's hard not to be pretty excited about going seven and three in our league non-conference schedule. When you think about what that means and how that might translate to March. And it's really hard not to get excited about the fact that this team that wasn't ranked preseason is looking like a one seed and, and has just won the big 10 title outright. Um, it's, it's, um, it's been a crazy year. I think they almost built our expectations up so high that they that we could only be let down if they ever lost, you know, or ever, yeah. ever faced any adversity. But in the grand scheme of things, you know, this is a really, really special ball club. I think they're poised to do some great things uh, moving forward. And to your point, Alan, I think last night was a huge, huge deal. By the way, don't want to forget to mention how big a win yesterday was for our women's basketball Oh, yeah, program. absolutely. I mean, that was one of the best finishes to a game. I mean, to be down 18 points, come all the way back and hit a game-winning, you know, wasn't quite a buzzer beater, but a three to end the game. I mean, that was pretty cool. So it was a great day to be a Boilermaker. Not so great for our friends in Madison, Wisconsin, but that's okay. I think Purdue owes uh, Wisconsin a thing or two. So that, uh, that hey, was it. you hey, know, man. Katie Gerald, you know, and 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 I think you you're, you have the, you can be a study of personalities. Matt Painter, Katie Gerald, uh, Ryan Walters. Katie brings a brash. Um, confidence to her she was a terrific player obviously an all-american level player uh she her attire in bloomington was fun she's a she is she <laughs> brings it to the brings it to the table uh, i thought it came out in her team because they didn't play well yesterday i mean and she said that post game it was not their best effort uh in, in terms of performance you get the job done uh, and probably punch your ticket to the ncaa tournament again hard to minimize that in her second year what I'll say about Katie, and I'm biased about Katie because she's my neighbor, so I've gotten yeah. to know her. Um, but you have to have people on your team and in your organization that hate to lose. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, one thing I've learned being around sports my whole life and um, is, man, everybody likes winning. I don't know anybody who doesn't like yeah. winning. Uh, but you got to have people who can't sleep at night when they lose. You know, who just losing is not an option. I mean, I think that's how she so quickly turned the program from where it was to where it is today. And, and, you know, I think she's really bringing her first big time recruiting class next year. So I'm really excited about the future of that program, but, but what makes her so confident is, I mean, she's just losing is not an option for her, yeah. you know, and it, it's so, so much it's that way that it's contagious and that team. And in particular, I think you see a few players on it that have really become an extension of her personality on the court, you know, Abby Ellis and Janae Terry come to mind, but really that, that whole team has just a, adopted a, Hey, Losing is unacceptable. We can beat anybody. I mean, you look at beating number two, Ohio State, no one would have seen that coming. Um, and we've got, I think right now, you know, four in our uh, four of our top sports, I would, I would say with volleyball and Dave Shondell, Matt with, with fo- men's basketball, Ryan with football, and then certainly Katie with women's basketball. I think we've got four people who really just hate to lose yeah. and, and really have a way of getting their whole team to take on that persona. It's pretty cool. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, and uh, personalities do it. All right. Your day job is challenging because uh, the great question of raising money, which you've had, you, you, we talked offline that you've had a good year from that standpoint, and uh, and yet balancing that wonderful balancing act now that NIL is in this world, and you've got to, for lack of a better word, compete for donors, and it may be the wrong way of looking at it, but tell me how you look at it and how you manage that. Because that is a challenge in today's environment. Because you've got to, you've got to, in the big picture, both have to be funded in some fashion. You're going to be fund, funding the John Purdue Club side of it, but uh, it certainly is an interesting uh, time to be doing this. So it's been an interesting time for sure. Uh, I, I think initially, like everyone else, you, you know, you, you're kind of skeptical of how this is going to work. You know, how, how are we going to make this? positive right you know and I think what what Mike Babinski has done a great job of at Purdue for us is you know everything we do is driven by our values we have to know who we are and what the best version of us is before we really make decisions on anything right Mm -hmm. and um I I feel as though we've done a great job of taking um you know I, I I think we were fairly conservative out of the gates, but that's kind of who Purdue is, to be fair. Um, And we've really ramped things up recently in the NIL space with the addition of Ryan and some of the things he he brought to the table in terms of experiences at other institutions and things that that he had been studying up on. And then, you know, you learn a little bit. And then once you know, okay, hey, this fits us. We know we're doing things permissibly. We know we're doing things in a way where we can manage expectations. Because the big thing we don't ever want to do 
Um, and I think Coach Painter does a better job of this than anybody in the country. Like, you know, we don't want to sell a young person on an experience they're not going to get. Yeah. You know, the reason we don't have a lot of transfers out of Matt's program and the reason kids are willing to wet red shirt is because he's so dang honest with them on the front end. You know, it, it, nothing is a surprise when you're a Purdue basketball player when you get here. And, and so with us in the NIL space, we've really tried to adopt that mindset. Now, as far as my role in terms of fundraising, well, we are fortunate. I mean, the Boilermaker Alliance group, uh, the board has been – I mean, it's made up of a lot of people who I knew previously yeah. that were not Purdue club members um, that, you know, I already had a previous relationship of trust with. And so it's made it pretty easy to work with them and, and have proper communication. We have the best compliance guy, I think, in the country and Tom Mitchell. He's been at Ohio State and USC, and he's now been at Purdue for, I think, 12 years now. Yeah. And, you know, he, he's on national committees. He's just really, really good. We're one of the few Power 5 schools that you've just never heard about uh, in the NCAA ledger for the wrong reasons for football or basketball. Um, and, and Tom's a big part of it. And he's really just helped us navigate the conversations we're having with donors. I mean, put bluntly, now I'm like when a donor says to me, how can I help? I can tell, I can educate them on how they can help with NIL and how, and how they can help with our you know facilities needs, which has been, you know, the basketball locker rooms, the, the football stadium, um, the, we, the golf course, we've been able to accomplish all those things and have those conversations, but also inform them that, Hey, if you do want to get involved in this NIL space, here's who you talk to. And we've been able to trust who we hand them off to. And the reality of it is we need both. You know, I mean, uh, right now the NCAA rules are what they are. And given the structure that's in place, it is paramount that we succeed in our fundraising efforts in the John Purdue Club, but also that, that the Boilermaker Alliance succeeds in their efforts in the NIL space. And right now I feel like we're doing a, a really good job. You know, I mean, is anybody perfect? No. But, um, you know, the people who thought that they were the best at NIL coming out of the gates, some of them had pretty darn bad seasons and some of them are facing sanctions right now yeah. as of last so, um, you know, I feel great about where we are and being at a place that, um, you know, that has done it the right way. I mean, I remember my interview at Purdue. I interviewed with Coach Painter and he said, basically, I'm paraphrasing. He said, Tim, like, if you get this job and you take it, like, uh, you know, people are going to say that they want us to win the national title and, and make it to the final four. He said, tell them two things. Nobody wants it more than me, but we're not going to cut a corner to do it. And he said, because I can live with anyone telling me that I could be a better coach in my recruiting or my scheming. He said, but I can't live with anyone asking me why I compromise their reputation as a Purdue alum by breaking the rules. And, and that's kind of how we feel about everything we do. Uh, so I'm really pleased that we've been able to continue to have a, a top five basketball program, a football team that had the success that they had. Laura and one of the hottest young coaches in the country, who's got a really elaborate and great NIL plan, work with him to get that plan implemented, bring in a, a top transfer out of the portal like Hudson Card, you know, show progress in that space and do it all without breaking any rules and, and knowing that we're doing everything above board. So um, long winded answer, but I, I'm, I'm really pleased with where we're at in that space, Alan. Yeah, you know, you have a master's degree in sports administration. You've been you've, you've modeled a few uniforms in terms of places you've been. Is this a case that uh, that um, guardrails are going to finally happen, and we're going to and 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 you feel confident that in three to five years this will be a pretty a, a something that you'll be more to easier to quantify in terms of what you're dealing with in the NIL space? Man, I hope so, and I, I do think you're. There's only one way to go, and that's up. I mean, it was kind of mass chaos when it first opened up. Uh, the timing of it, I mean, was was really hard. I mean, I, I um, do I think the NCAA could have done some things differently? Sure. But, like, it's easy to armchair quarterback, yeah. right? You know, I mean, I, I, I would tell you that everyone being at home and being on their cell phones in the middle of a pandemic when this thing hit was – absolute worst case scenario yeah. you know the court of public opinion ran wild and put people in decision making positions in a very tough spot i am very excited about our new president president baker at the ncaa um i think anyone regardless of what your politics are you know if you look at his history in politics to be elected as a governor of massachusetts kennedy's massachusetts as a republican twice you know, he's got to be somewhat pretty good at being bipartisan, getting things done, um, you, you know, in that political realm. And that's what it's going to take because any decision we make is going to have to hold up. You know, any, anything we do to regulate this is going to have to hold up. It's going to have to have partnership from D.C. Um, and at the state level. And he's going to have to navigate and lead that charge. And I, I think last what's been going on the last week or so shows me that he's he's got a mind to, to get it done. You know, I think he's an intelligent man. He played basketball at Harvard. He yeah. understands 
student athletes go through, but at the same time, you know, went to one of the institutions that like Purdue, Purdue values academics and the whole student athlete experience at a very high level. So I find myself very optimistic. You know, I'm very glad I'm not in his role uh, at this <laughs> point. In my career. I, I certainly am not prepared to, to get it there uh, the way he is. Um, but I find myself very excited about President Baker's leadership and where it's going to take us. And, um, you know, there's just too much good that happens in college athletics for us not to figure it out. I mean, I think we get so caught up all the time and um, and just focusing on the kids on the field. And don't get me wrong, they're my number one priority as a member of this athletics department. But there's so many people, so many young people in the stands that are being inspired to pursue higher education because of these games. You know, grandkids and kids brought to games or that watch in living rooms with, with, with their grandparents and their parents that get the idea of I'm going to go to Purdue because I grew up a Purdue fan or I got to go to Ross eight. I got to go to Mackey arena that man, that's too special for us to mess up. So I, the, the long winded answer, you know, kind of coming full circle on my long winded answer is we're absolutely going to get there. We have to, we have to, it's a part of the fabric of this nation to figure this out. And I have full faith that we're going to, you know, it's just like anything new. You're going to hit some growing pains along the way. And I think we're going to get there with it though. All right. Last question. Got a couple minutes left. Lamar Lundy initiative uh, with John Purdue club, a new and exciting uh, initiative as well. Really important in the diversity equity uh, inclusion as well. Or, space, I should say. Tell us a little bit about that and what uh, what uh, fans and, and uh, not only donors, but fans can understand about, uh, about that project. Sure. So, I mean, for us, we wanted to do a better job branding our top uh, giving level, the, the, you know, beyond the annual fund, the people who really step up in a major way, you know, these, the, the, the levels for this society or this league rather are 250 K gifts or a million dollar gifts or, or more. Uh, those are people who, you know, not everybody is blessed to be able to do that, but man, if someone's going to be that sort of generous with us, we want to really go above and beyond in our stewardship of that effort and say, thank you. You know, I mean, they, they're going to have access to, um, different spaces and be around the teams with with all access credentials for basketball games and football games. Um, and, and, you know, they're going to get to go on some trips like our first trip to L.A. Uh, for, a, for a football game out there against either USC or UCLA. When, when we know what that is, we're going to charter a flight for that group um, and, and just go again above and beyond with our access and, and benefits. You know, we're going to do some things around the Maui Invitational next year, which, by the way, uh, we've been told by the term, I think we've sold more packages than any school ever has. We've blown through uh, any allotment that they had planned for us. Um, and it, it's actually the biggest trip we've ever done, even out outnumbering any bowl game we've ever done, which is crazy when you think about capacity of a football stadium versus that little arena down in yeah, Lane. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So um, really excited about those things. And as you alluded to, I mean, I think it is important from a diversity inclusion standpoint to recognize someone like Lamar Lundy. The fact that we really hadn't done more to recognize not only our first black scholarship player at Purdue, our first black scholarship football player, but someone who was a basketball and football MVP and all conference player in both sports, a member of the fearsome foursome, a really storied NFL career. Um, you know, during COVID, I think there was a lot of time for a lot of us to reflect on our history and how we did a better job highlighting it. And his was one of the first names that jumped off to me personally, as I started doing my part to help in that effort, I was like, holy cow, Lamar Lundy went to Purdue. I can't believe that. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll admit it, I didn't know it prior to COVID. And when I saw that, it just kind of got in my head of like, we got to do something. And yeah. this just seemed like a really fitting opportunity because again, this is, this is a way to acknowledge those who have been most uh, helpful in our, our efforts to transform Purdue athletics and take it forward. And that's exactly what Lamar Lundy did with his decision to come to Purdue all those years ago as our first black scholarship football player. So it just really worked out well together as a way to do something that probably should have been done a while back in honoring Lamar um, but also do it in a way that pushes us forward and acknowledges some of the great things that are going on today. Yeah, terrific athlete, uh, historic in, in, in a number of – can you imagine being an MVP in basketball and in football? And this is in the 1930s in terms of where, you know, playing two sports at that time uh, started to become very rare, and uh, he was he was certainly in that uh, mode as well. Tim, safe travels back. Uh, get through this rain, and we appreciate so much your time. Always interesting. And uh, here's to a fun weekend for Purdue folks in Chicago and maybe Columbus, maybe 
New York or wherever, maybe even Houston. Who knows? Yeah. It'd be, it's going to be a fun, well, fun few weeks. Yeah, let's have fun in Minneapolis with the with the women's team this weekend too. And and, and at home, let's finish off strong. Win on senior night. And I thank you, Alan, for everything you and your team do. I I so enjoy um, you know reading the, the content that y'all put out. Y'all do such a great job covering us. Um, the folks that subscribe to your content, we have, we have the best fan base in the country. I told Coach Walters when he got the job, I said, "Listen, man, you are not going to believe how these people fill out these stadiums, how much they care." And I think you guys do a great job of helping us with that. And uh, to that end, we're talking about your team, please let Brian know he's in our thoughts and prayers. Um, miss having that guy around. He does such a great job covering Purdue basketball. Mike's doing an awesome job this year in his, his stead, but appreciate everything you guys do. All right, I will definitely pass that along. And uh, Brian's still cranking out those videos, so we appreciate that too. And we will be back. Speaking of Mike Carmen, Mike and Tom Deanhart will join us for segment three. Tim, thanks again. We'll be back in two minutes on Golden Black Live. Thanks to our guest and the Union Club Hotel for sponsoring it. As a reminder, join us on Wednesday, March the 8th at the Boiler Up Bar Whiskey Room uh, or on Facebook Live as Mike Carmen and I will be talking Big Ten Tournament and more. And we appreciate all of you for watching and listening. As Brian Newbert always says, processing our materials in the way that you do. Have a great rest of the weekend, all.